When I walked our daughter down the aisle at her 2008 wedding, I knew that Teresa's parents would never know that joy. At the birth of our two granddaughters, I remember Teresa's words in her video diary. She said, that's the one thing I always wanted to be is a mom. Someday I'll be a great mom. Our oldest granddaughter, Chloe, is almost four. She bounds out of bed at an ungodly hour, could be three in the morning, raises the shade on her window, and despite, no matter what the weather, says, look, Grandma, it's a beautiful day. Tim Halbach, in a moving eulogy to his sister, said, every day with Teresa was a good day. To me, these two women, one just beginning life and one whose life was cut short, have shared the quintessential. Today is all that we have. Perhaps making each day a good day is how all of us can, tri can pay tribute to Teresa and to all of those who have <coughs> suffered the ripple effect of wrongful conviction. I thank you very much for your attention tonight, and I would be happy to entertain any questions you have. Thank you so much. Let me just real quickly, I always do this, I forget how many through that I have slides. This is Gregory Allen's photo. When Dateline did their special, Gregory Allen told the Dateline people, I've never had a beard in my life. Wrong. <laughs> okay, the quality of this picture is not, but the detail that I got wrong for both of these men is I said my ceiling had brown eyes and they have blue eyes. Stephen, it's not a great picture of Gregory Allen or Stephen Avery, they're a little grainy. But I met Stephen in person, and he has very light, bright blue eyes. There's no mistaking that they're blue. My husband has brown eyes that are similar in color to Gregory Allen's. Um, if my husband, they're just kind of blue, but not real bright. If he wears a brown shirt, his eyes look a little hazel. If he wears a green shirt, his eyes look green. If he wears a blue shirt, they look really blue. And I suspect that that might be true of Gregory Allen. People who know both of them have said there's no mistaking that Stephen Avery has blue eyes. And I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, I was also um, told by an attorney in Mantua that the police artist, before he did the sketch, was handled, handed a picture of Stephen Avery and told to make the sketch look like this. Um, the sketch artist has since died of a heart attack. Um, and uh, there's no way to verify whether that ever occurred. Um, but I don't know what you think. I don't think this, I don't think it looks like anybody, but I generally don't think most of these sketches look like. If anyone has questions, there's no questions that are off limits. Um, I'm happy to. Let me just repeat the question because I know they're taping this for the benefit of those who couldn't be here. Um, the question was that within a couple of years of um, my assault, I wanted to meet with Stephen Avery in a victim offender conference. And um, was that sort of the starting point of my thinking that perhaps he had been wrongly convicted? No, I don't think so. I think it was much later. Um, it, it's pretty amazing how your perspective changes with time. He got a 32-year sentence. According to the sentencing guidelines, he could have gotten up to 64 years. So initially I thought, ah, 32 years, slap on the wrist. Well, <laughs> that really changed over time. And eventually, I think part of it was he kept insisting he was innocent. He was running ads in the paper. They had started a legal defense fund. And I talked to, 
you know, being in prison and, and there were some groups, when I spoke to sex offender treatment groups, I got to know some of the mentors who were inmates, but who were repeatedly in the audience when I spoke, um, and especially if I was in a treatment group with the men. And a lot of them said, you know, when I first got here, I said I was innocent too, but I actually gave that up after a while. But he was so persistent. Um, and I think, so I think it kind of crept in gradually, you know, like, oh, this guy just doesn't give up. Um, and then when the, when the Innocence Project, um, in 2001, agreed to take on his case, I knew that Innocence Projects get hundreds and hundreds of requests, many more than they can handle, and so what was different about this one? And then I learned that it was actually one of his attorneys, um, I think, who was very, had been concerned all along that he had been wrongfully convicted, who had approached the Innocence Projects. So I think it was a gradual process, but it was a number of years down the road. I think I saw him behind the... <laughs> oh, okay, I'll... I, you're next. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Earlier you mentioned that when the police department contacted you about the second suspect, you asked the sheriff's office to look into it, and then the sheriff's office told you about his airtight alibi. Did they purposely lie about that? Boy, I don't know that I can. Uh, the question was um, when I asked the sheriff, when I called the sheriff about the police department saying we've got another suspect, and then the sheriff's department told me that my that the other suspect had the airtight alibi, did they specifically lie? I can't really answer that. I think they might have been given this information. You know, maybe somebody said, oh, I think he's on probation. I think all of us had tunnel vision. And it's a, it's a common human occurrence. Um, we have a theory of what happened. For example, so anything I heard about Stephen Avery, you know, I heard that he beat his wife. Um, we had a candy store, next to our candy store was a flower shop. Well, the owner of the flower shop had sent me flowers when I was in the hospital, so when I went back to work, I went to thank Noe for the flowers. She said, oh, I've been meaning to call you. The day after you were assaulted, and Stephen Avery's picture was on the news, a woman came in with her 16-year-old daughter. They had been at Planned Parenthood because her daughter thought, she said her daughter watched the news the night before, burst into tears and said, Mom, that guy on the news, he, he raped me and I think I'm pregnant. So I hear this and I think, oh, well, it's corroborating the evidence or, you know, evidence of previous, I don't know what you call it legally, but anyway, this could be helpful in, in prosecuting Stephen Avery. So I said to Millie, do you know who this woman was? She said, no, I have no idea, I never saw her before. Did she pay with a check or a credit card? No, nope, she paid cash. And she had been at Planned Parenthood, but because of their confidentiality, there was no way of finding out who this woman was. But anyway, I took that to heart. Then I learned from Judy Dvorak, the deputy, that Steve beat his wife. Small town, you hear all this gossip. So anything that tended to support my theory that you know, I had identified the right person, I really clung on to. Um, and no one, the victim witness didn't say, coordinator didn't say to me, I think you got the wrong guy. That wasn't her role, it wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, and I think sometimes the same thing happens with police um, and even prosecutors, that they kind of, you know, that they knew Stephen Avery had attempted to assault the sheriff's deputy's wife. And I give a description, and it sounds like Steve and the guys kind of look alike. Um, and so they have this theory, and I'm a confident witness. They share information with me. The more I hear about Steve's past, the more confident I get. The stronger witness I am, the more confident they get. You know, wow, we got a, a really confident eyewitness here. So that's the danger of tunnel vision, and, and I think it's very important, and DNA will help in that, hopefully, um, especially if it can be done uh, pre-trial. Um, 
but I, I can't answer that. And, and the one thing I should say is, I told my version of the story tonight. If the DA was here, prosecutor was here, they would tell their vision, their version, um, and we would all say, I'm telling them that that's awful truth, and, and we would believe it. Yes.
were able to work together, um, it, it started getting very contentious. Um, and it's not very unfortunate that funding ran out, but even if funding hadn't, it was almost to the point where we were wetting heads, where the um, very conservative representatives from the AG's office, because there was a new attorney general, um, were just not willing to bend at all in coming up with guidelines. Um, two-part question about the lineups. Um, first of all, when you were told uh, that they had a suspect and that the suspect was in the photo lineup, I was wondering if that might have, um, you know, uh, influenced your decision. Maybe if they hadn't said that, you could have said, no, he's not here, um, like you did with the jacket. If maybe you were kind of looking for the person and maybe Stephen looked the most familiar because he lived close to, you know, next door to your friend. Um, and also, if being told that you got the suspect after, after the photo lineup, they told you that, yes, that's who we had in mind, if that maybe, um, you know, like made you more confident for the, for the live lineup and for later on in court, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, do I need to repeat that? Do you want to? I'm, do you I'm think right here. He's right here. Did yeah, okay. everybody hear that? Um, first part was, oh, repeat the first part. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if being told that the suspect was there. Okay. They, they yeah. didn't actually, they told me they, um, I asked if they had a suspect in mind, and I was told yes. And then they put the photos down. They didn't say the suspect's photo was in here. I made that assumption. Um, they probably should have given a neutral answer when I asked, do you have a suspect in mind? But there was no instruction then that said, you, you know, the suspect may or may not be in the line. Right. Yeah. What they recommend now is that an instruction be given, uh, we're going to ask you to look at a group of photos. The person who assaulted you may or may not be in this photo array. Whether or not you pick somebody from the array, the investigation will continue. Um, I was told to look at the photos to see whether the assailant might be among them. I assumed, well, they told me they have a suspect in mind, so I'm sure they put the suspect's photo in here. So it probably absolutely influenced, um, also it influenced my choice. You know, that, well, suspect's in here, so. Um, I, I did have a gut reaction when I came to Steve in the live lineup. Um, but that was probably because I had picked his photo. And the second question, part of the question was... Um, After they told you, yes, you got the guy that we... Right, I'm sure my confidence went up the next day when I learned. And that's the thing about memory. It can be influenced by occurrences post-event. So, um, you know, they, they recommend that lineups be done sequentially now, not simultaneously. That if you're shown a group of photos and it's a fairly good lineup, someone in there will look most like the suspect. And it's kind of like a multiple choice question. If you are shown one photo at a time or in a lineup, if one person comes out at a time in a live lineup, it's more like a true or false question. Yes, this is the person that assaulted me. No, this is not the person. So you're not comparing the, the people in the lineups to one another. You're comparing one individual to your memory. Yes? Um, if had Stephen and Gregory been in the same lineup, do you think they still would have been Stephen over Gregory? I have no way of knowing that. The question was, if Stephen and um, Gregory Allen had been in the both been in the lineup, do I think I would have picked Stephen? And I think what a memory expert would tell you is that question is unanswerable. That once, the way it works is initially I have an image in my brain of my assailant. Then I give a description for a drawing, they show me the drawing. Now I, it's like you think of each image as a strand of yarn. Now I have two strands of yarn, two memory strands to picture the 
artist drawing in my original memory, and they become entwined. And I pick Steve's photo, I pick Steve's photo, and now I have three images, and that once they're intertwined, and they aren't sure exactly why memory works this way, but it's like you can't go back and pull out those individual strands um, of memory. Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I, I guess my advice to everybody was try and, is try and keep an open mind. Um, you know, we all start with a theory, and if if there's evidence that suggests that maybe we're going down the wrong path, it's never too late to veer from the course we started on. Um, one of the things they recommend in terms of lineups is that the person administering the lineup not know who the suspect is. It's like a double blind in medicine. Um, and because sometimes I think um, we unconsciously give off nonverbal cues. Um, so if the, if the person administering the lineup doesn't know who the suspect is, he's just going to be putting all those down one at a time. And not influencing the person doing the lineup in any way. I don't know if either of you have. Law enforcement is a it's tough because you know none of us knows what another person's job is like. I have not walked a mile in a law enforcement official's shoes, and I think they really set out with the best of intentions to keep the public safe. To make no, nobody wants to be involved in a wrongful conviction. Nobody. Um, so I think it's it's really tough, and I have no idea what it must be like to walk me and to worry about your life being in danger. Um, so I don't want to give cops a bad rap, but I know they can be a tough audience. Um, and tough in terms of, you know, they've had very specific training. And I think it's important maybe in police academies to start with young officers. Um, it's really hard for all of us as we get Social Security and get older. <laughs> to be flexible and, and try and look at things um, objectively. That's a great answer to a really tough question. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Mike. You're going to have a few more moments. If, uh, and might be willing to 